opportunity to present our next two panelists, both from the Gallup organization. They'll be doing a panel on what leaders need to know about strengths, hope, engagement, and well-being. We have Shane Lopez with us. He is a senior scientist in residence and is an architect of the Gallup Student Poll. A measure of hope, engagement, and well-being, the student poll taps into the hearts and minds of American students to determine what drives achievement. Dr. Lopez is the director of the annual Gallup Well-Being Forum, which convenes scholars, leaders, and decision makers to discuss health care and global well-being. He also serves as the research director for the Clifton Strength School. We also have Jim Harder, and it's his birthday today. <laughs> Jim is the Chief Scientist of Workplace Management and Well-Being for Gallup's Workplace Management Practice. His research has been popularized in the business bestsellers first, Break All the Rules and How Full is Your Bucket, and in academic articles, book chapters, and publications such as USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. He is co-author of the New York Times bestseller, 12 the, 12, the Elements of Great Managing, an Exploration of the 12 Crucial Ingredients for Creating and Harnessing Employee Engagement. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's been a wonderful day, and hopefully we can wrap things up on a very positive and hopeful note. Um, we're going to talk about strengths, hope, engagement, and well-being. Typically, we need five days to do this. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize our talk in the next um, 30 seconds. Um, doing what you do best every day promotes hope, engagement, and well-being. So strengths development promotes um, hope, engagement, and well-being. The past doesn't always predict performance best. So Meals Maxim is, is wrong. Actually, it takes multiple things to predict performance. But sometimes, hope trumps the past when predicting performance. So I'll talk about that. Then Jim will take over and talk about how leaders are, in large part, responsible for the engagement of their employees. And I'll add students to that. So leaders are, in large part, responsible for employee engagement and student engagement. And finally, well-being is more than health, and it's more than happiness. And oh yeah, as leaders, you're responsible for it too. Um, so those, those are our highlights. Have a good night. <laughs> All right. I'll jump into a little bit of this. We've heard about strengths. We've heard about the strengths philosophy. Who in here has taken a strengths measure, whether it's the, whether it's the Clifton Strengths Finder or the VIA? OK, so you're one of six to seven million people on the planet that actually know your strengths. We think everyone should know their strengths. We think everyone does know their strengths. But we're not even at that point where everyone thinks that knowing your strengths is a good idea. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about that because in this room, we believe this is a wonderful idea, but it's not necessarily the case in corporate America or uh, corporate education. Okay, American education. Um, do you get to use your strengths every day? When we ask this to folks, 32% um, of Americans strongly believe, um, they say, yeah, I get to use my strengths every day. 36% um, of folks in India, um, and then next in line, Germany at, uh, excuse me, Canada at 30%. And on a lot of these questions about strengths, US and Canada are very similar. Uh, Germany at 26, and then UK at 17, 15, 14, 13 for France. So this strengths philosophy, obviously, maybe it's out there in the ether, but, but people aren't necessarily living it and allowing other folks to use their strengths every day. We've asked a few other questions related to this. When a manager discusses your performance with you, do you spend more time talking about how to build your strengths or how to improve your weaknesses? So think about your last discussion with a manager. We've asked this question numerous times. Uh, most recently, we found that um, 41% of, of Americans say strengths. We focus on our strengths. 38% uh, of Canadians, 38% of uh, folks in the UK, then 29, 24, 24. Now, we can look at this in a lot of different ways. And, and the, the summary statement that works best for me is across the world, less than 50% of folks even subscribe to this strengths philosophy. Across the world, less than 50% of people in leadership positions, less than 50% of teachers. Let's talk about teachers. When a teacher 
discusses your child's performance with you, do you spend more time talking about how to build your child's strengths or how to improve your child's weaknesses? So think about the last meeting you went to with your child's teacher and how did that go? What did you focus on? Well, here's what um, 2,835 parents of school age uh, children said in 2009. 48.5% said we focus on improving weaknesses. 48% uh, said improving weaknesses, 27% building strengths, and the, act, the next group is the one I'm actually most concerned about. 25% teacher does not talk to me about these things. Well, what the hell do they talk to you about? Um, so across the nation, less than 30% of teachers probably subscribe to a strengths philosophy. So in the last 10 years, we've built these great tools. There's tons of books, uh, uh, as Kim talked about, focusing on strengths development. Um, everybody, either, either with no money or a little money, could identify their strengths with a formal measure or a best self-narrative. However, only less than 10 million folks have done that around the world. Um, and less than 50% of folks think it's a, it's a great idea, uh, meaning we should teach, um, we should focus on that um, when it comes to child development, we should focus on that when it comes to employee development. Um, so I say all this because I think when we get into these rooms, we think this is happening everywhere. And it's not. And you will encounter folks in your daily life, and it might even be around the dinner table tonight, um, who disagree with this philosophy. And I think that's where the good science comes in. So when we know more about how and why strengths develop, then we can make a good case for, hey, why don't you learn about your strengths and why don't we take this organization from a weakness-based organization and turn it into a strengths-based center of some sort. Um, another question, and this is, uh, I just like to provoke people. Um, Suppose your child came home with these grades, two A's, a B, a C, and a low grade such as a D or an F. Which of these grades would you deem worthy of considerable conversation? We asked this question a long time ago, Jim. We updated it with this panel study of 2,835 parents of school-aged children. These are the same parents, by the way, who said, I asked them, because um, I made all the calls, of course, I asked them, um, um, what's the one thing you can do to increase the graduation rate at your local high school? The one thing. What do you think the most popular response was? Don't know nothing. 23%. Okay? Now, these parents gave us a ton of data, but that one just caught me off guard um, because I think these are parents who care about their kids, care about schools, but yet we they don't know how to engage in the community in such a way to drive change. But back to these parents as they see their, grade, uh, their kids' grades. Um, so I have a five-year-old, Jim has a couple of boys, um, um, in elementary and middle, and, and of course, we practice what we preach. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always catching myself um, when I'm working with Parrish, trying to focus on what he does best. But he has this little thing called gestalt. Um, it's not measured on uh, the strengths finder, per se, um, but the teachers at his uh, preschool, he goes to the Donald O. Clifton Child Development Center, uh, which is a strengths-based child development center, and his teachers have this long list of kids' strengths, and one of them is gestalt, which means, as, as his teachers told me a hundred times, Shane, when he's working on something, don't interrupt him and let him finish. I'm like, we gotta go. We have stuff to do. It's like, that's what he's thinking right now. Daddy, I've got to finish this. Well, that's not my problem. You know? So I've learned over the last two years that he really needs to finish this. And when I allow him to stay in that little flow state, everything's so much better. So when I bind my anxiety and focus on what he needs to get to let his strengths manifest, then things work better. But back to back to the A's, D, C, uh, A, B, C's, and of course we're going to focus on the F's. 86.7 uh, said we're going to focus on the D's or F's. And I know what you're thinking. Well, that's important. And they've never made a D or an F, so I have to focus on that. It's the outlier, so I have to focus on that. We ask parents um, why you focus uh, on the D or the F. And it's kind of like asking um, college students, why did you drop out of college? Um, because of the money. 
It's always because of the money. If you go around the country, 1,400 universities, and you ask them, you know, what's your biggest problem with retention? Kids say the money. But then you have to peel the onion back and you find out that it's a lot more about some other things. Um, and here parents say, well, it's the outlier. So I have to focus on the outlier. But we've just trained ourselves to key in on uh, that negative deviance uh, that Kim was talking about earlier and work, work, work. Now let's do a little scaffolding here though. If we believe in broaden and build, how would we have a good conversation about a student's performance? Would we start with the fear and anxiety that goes with the discussion of the D or the F and then close them down so they're hearing you know, Charlie Brown's teacher's voice in their head, wah, 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 while you're talking? Or would we start with the A or the B and then open up the discussion and allow for the, the hard talk about the D or the F? So really these data just, just let us know, number one, less than 50% of, of people in the world, I believe, um, don't carry the strengths philosophy. Um, number two, we have a hard time practicing this focus on positive deviance sometimes in our own lives. Now, we're trying to remedy that and we're trying to do it because, not because we have this great measure and it's online and you can take it and all that good stuff, but we believe that strengths development really works. And strengths development works when it comes to the bottom line. So we have great data. One slide comes to mind about a, a, a vacation club and they did identification of their salespeople and then they had one strengths-based conversation with those salespeople, uh, the managers did, and sales went up. Okay, one strengths-based conversation because it was so new and different from what they were getting and it focused on what they were doing best and gave them ideas about how to move sales through their strengths. But what I want to focus on a little bit today is education because we have a lot of people in the room um, who are leaders with that small L and they're leading um, an educational effort in some way. But first I need to tell you a little bit about the tools we do use. Um, First uh, was developed in, in the late 1990s, the Clifton Strengths Finder. Uh, and we use that primarily in adults in a work setting. Uh, Jim and I can get in a battle royale about how many languages it's in, but it's in more than 20 languages. Um, and we validate it along the way when we translate it. Um, we then, in um, you know, early 2003, 2004, started to dabble with it. Um, in colleges and universities and then in high schools and essentially we took the strengths finder and we wrapped it with an educational package called strengths quest so I don't want to confuse you here strengths finder is the measure you take when you take strengths quest um, but then all the action items in, in the program guide relate to your educational pursuits so if you have a high school or a college student in mind you would probably want them to take Strengths Quest because it would generate that, that school based conversation. Strengths Quest and Strengths Finder are the, the same basic tool 178 items. We give you 20 seconds to respond to each item. Um, it takes you about 25 to 30 minutes to complete. Um, and if you have um, some problem or, or disability and you need us to turn the timer off, um, we can do that. I say all that because um, we're on over 400 campuses nationwide over 400 campuses nationwide. We work from every office from um, student leadership to freshman orientation um, to um, uh, special services. We work with every office on campus so we've really gotten pretty flexible in how we administer this thing. Uh, with the Strengths Finder, we're in numerous companies across the world uh, so chances are in the next week you'll interface with either a bank teller or a retailer um, or uh, someone in civil service that knows their strengths and they're trying to live those strengths every day. Finally, with the Clifton Youth Strengths Explorer, um, we developed this uh, a few years ago and it's specifically for that middle school age, uh, late elementary and middle school age. Um, and what we're trying to do there is use a young person's strengths to drive their hope and engagement, particularly engagement because um, if you look at engagement, and I'm kind of uh, going into Jim's territory here, but if you look at student engagement, it looks beautiful through elementary school until about sixth grade. And then it falls, 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 troughs out in tenth grade, and then it ticks up because the most actively disengaged people go away. So we're looking for some, sol some solutions to that student engagement decline and one solution um, is helping students do what they do best every day 
um, after finding out their strengths from the Strengths Explorer. With these uh, three efforts, uh, through these three measures, um, we've touched the lives of nearly six million people. Um, and our goal this year is a quarter million college students, and, and we have, of course, a loftier goal for enterprise. But we want to get to the place where we're working with a million college students every year. And when I say working with, we don't want to be known as that company with the tool. That company, not me, the tool, but the tool, the measure. Um, <laughs> That company with um, that measure. We don't in any way want to be the next Myers Briggs. We don't want to be the next strong interest inventory. Those things have a valuable role in the college environment. Um, we do want to supplant Nessie, but that's a different story. Um, we want to do some things that identify talent and then develop strengths through individualization and time and effort. If you take a strengths measure, it may do you no good. It won't necessarily harm you. We haven't had, we haven't uh, in any studies found that that's going to hurt you in some way. But very frankly, it, it may go in a drawer and the results will do you absolutely no good. Or you may say, um, and this builds on a point Todd made this morning about uh, uh, the generation we're dealing with now uh, in colleges, you may say, I knew I was special. Therefore, I don't have to do the things you told me I need to do. Look at these five words, like mine. Futuristic Maximizer Ranger Ideation Strategic. Futuristic maximizers don't write 20-page papers in philosophy class. We create philosophy. So, we can, in fact, in fact, by measuring strengths and going away and not doing a good job supporting the development of that person. We can, in fact, create what Carol Dweck would call a closed mindset. And we could basically say, just like we do when we measure someone's intelligence and say, boy, you're two standard deviations above the mean. I don't know many people, number one, there aren't many people who are two standard deviations above the mean, and number two, who actually use both of those standard deviations for good. Um, because a lot of times, folks with um, that belief that, oh, I'm bright, often have, if they have a closed mindset, belief, I don't have to try. I'm so smart, it will come natural. And we found that when we test for strengths and then we walk away and offer no development, folks start thinking, I'm special, therefore things should come easy to me. And we don't want to be involved in that kind of enterprise. So what needs to happen is just like any good teaching, good development, good counseling, you need to individualize some, some student development work. So student affairs people, faculty people need to work with the student. And, and here's a simple prescription. And this is for you in, in enterprise as well in, in different parts of civil service. Use, if, if you just learned your top five, let's say, top five strengths, use your top strength in a novel way five times next week in a novel way. You know, just, you may use it in a relationship, you may use it at church, you may use it with your child, it may not even be at work. You may use it as you discover a new hobby. Use your top strength in a novel way next week. And then you may take some time off and just see what that does, and then you may use your second strength in a novel way five times another week. And that in itself, um, it's been demonstrated, will enhance the things we're talking about in terms of, of hope and, and, and other positive characteristics. And the other thing, uh, I remember Barbara Ehrenreich wrote a review of, of one of Gallup's books and, and unfortunately she lumped it in with another book that was popular at the time, Who Moved My Cheese? Um, and it was called, Who Moved My Effort? Who Moved My Effort? Um, suggesting that, that positive psych-like stuff suggests you just have to think happy thoughts and everything will be okay. And no, it takes a lot of hard work to develop your strengths. I remember Don told me, he said, you've got this futuristic thing and like any intense top talent, you could work the rest of your life just developing that top talent. And for the last 10 years, I've worked on futuristic and maximizer and I haven't touched the other three. So my efforts to apply them in novel situations, my efforts to get good coaching have been around those two. So think about that novel application idea. I want to tell you where it has worked, and again, I do want to focus this on um, some education examples, but we do have a ton of uh, enterprise examples. We, last year, uh, 
we worked with a, about 200 high school freshmen. They completed the Strengths Finder, but then they had these strengths based educators who were trained by us kind of wrapping around them. So 200 freshmen had about five strengths based educators just interacting with them in lots of ways, uh, doing weekly activities. Um, they created a strengths display, small group discussions, and then they had one 15 minute individualized strengths conference. So we don't know which part of that worked and, and we have to deconstruct the intervention of course, but what we found is that the students subjected to that strengths based education uh, had a significant increase in hope. Um, over just a short period of time, over about four months time. And I'll tell you why that's important to high school students here in a minute when I talk about hope. We did the same thing with college students in two different studies. Um, one was a, a mentoring study and one was an advising, advising study. And essentially we did one-on-one uh, -on -one strengths based advising or one-on-one -on -one strengths based mentoring. Uh, the difference was the strengths based advising was conducted by student affairs professionals and they were focusing on how to leverage uh, your strengths for course selection and your future. Um, and then the strengths based mentoring was done by counseling psych, PhD and master's students and they were focusing on how to leverage your strengths for school work and life. So it was just kind of a broader application. Uh, but there was individualized time spent with each student and again we found significant increases in hope in those two applications. Now why does that matter? And I'm jumping a little bit and, and we could do several days on strengths, but I want to tell you why we aim strengths at hope um, and then Jim will talk about engagement and well-being. But first I think I need to define hope. Um, Barack Obama got us halfway there. Um, Barack helped us create this beautiful image of the future which would be better than the present. And that's half of hope. The other half is having the belief in your own personal power to make that future a reality. Okay? So you have to be hopeful, you have to have a belief that the future will be better than the present and you have the power to make it so. Now the power to make it so is made up of ideas and energy. So we go back to positive energy which Kim was talking about today and we roll in a little bandura and self-efficacy and then you've got this agenic component of hope. Um, our technical definition of, of hope is goal-directed thinking that requires um, pathways, thoughts, plus agency thoughts to get from where you are today to where you want to be tomorrow. Okay, it's ideas and energy for the future. Okay, um, if you're in an academic environment, GPA is a good way to summarize it. Goals thinking, pathways thinking, agency thinking, uh, the new GPA. Goal thinking, pathways thinking, agency thinking, but we typically talk about future ideas and energy. And it's uniquely human uh, because of the way our brains are made up. Um, only humans can think about the future in a complex way. Only humans can be hopeful. It matters. I'll tell you why it matters. It can be enhanced and it's viral. Um, tons of good work. We can increase hope, uh, stay in hope in five minutes. Um, and we can increase trade hope in five hours. We've demonstrated that time and time again. Um, this is one thing that does relate to that energy uh, quote, um, energy work that Ken was talking about. We Gallup studied the impact that leaders can have throughout an organization. The single most powerful predictor um, was whether the leadership made them feel enthusiastic about the future. So not just this enthusiasm that ran amok, okay, but enthusiasm about the future. 69% of employees who strongly agreed with that statement were engaged in their jobs compared to a mere 1% who disagreed or strongly disagreed. Enthusiastic about the future. And, and CEOs get this, managers get this, principals don't get this. Teachers don't get this. When we tell them you have to make your students feel enthusiastic about the future to keep them engaged, it takes a while to get that uh, message across. But I think it could change the nature of student engagement in education at all levels. Um, we, Todd mentioned a study about what people want. Um, happiness is on the list, but it's not as high as he, he, he had cited. Um, when we asked folks in 2005, um, all of us want certain things when you think about what really matters in your life, what are your wishes and hopes for the future? Um, and I hate that word wishes, but we'll deal with it. Um, health was number one. Wealth was number two. Happiness was number three. Family, uh, play, uh, close, safe, secure family. More of the same, uh, number five. Good job, um, number six. And we find that around the world it's in the top ten. 
God, housing, and peace. Now, um, when I told Chris Peterson about these findings, and he's the optimism guy, um, you know, he said, uh, well, of course. I mean, my life is great. Um, I wouldn't want to change a thing. I said, really? He goes, yeah, you moved from Lawrence, Kansas to Omaha, Nebraska to work at Gallup, so your life must have sucked and, and you wanted something better. Um, you know, but my life is great. I want exactly what I have. And we were drinking. He took a drink of beer and he said, or I'm scared as hell to change it. You know, so it's interesting that, that even in that, that answer of more of the same, um, I wonder how that breaks all down. Um, I don't want to intrude too much in Jim's time, but hope matters. Hope helps us save money. You can go to Feed the Pig. Um, I'm a little hesitant to do that, but I will. Um, you can go to feedthepig.org um, and see a talking pig um, talk to you about saving money with these hope-based messages. Um, and he may not come on, which is a good thing. Um, you can go to stick.com um, and, and find out how to apply hope in your own life through four easy steps. And it, it rolls hope theory in with behavioral economics uh, work and demonstrates that um, you can create goals, ideas, and energy and overcome obstacles. Um, and it is stick with two Ks, by the way. Um, and get to where you want to be. Um, and if you're interested in child development, uh, Ready, Set, Learn on uh, uh, Discovery Television, they do a nice job with hope. Um, and if any of your kids or grandkids eat goldfish crackers, um, there's a whole website um, that backs that product called fishfulthinking.com, which is all about optimism and hope and building that in your kids. Um, hope and health, I'll, I'll cite a couple of things here. Um, number one, hopeful people, high hope people tolerate pain twice as well as low hope people. High hope people tolerate twice as much pain. Uh, twice as well, twice as much pain as low hope people, and twice as long in another study. So let me say that again. Um, in the study I want to focus on, high hope people tolerate pain twice as long as low hope people. How do we find that out? Well, of course, we subjected people to pain. Um, we asked them to put their hands in a bucket of ice water. It's called the cold presser task. And time and time again, high hope people tolerate pain twice as long as low hope people. I then had a student, Carla Berg, who said, Shane, I want to, I want to induce hope and then have people do the task. I said, well, you need low hope people and you need five hours. And she said, I'm going to take low hope people in 20 minutes. I said, well, it won't work, but go ahead, it's your dissertation. Um, and I just love it when my students don't listen to me. Um, she did it. She boosted um, hope through guided imagery in 20 minutes, uh, stayed hope. And the students, they were all, these were all low hope students. Um, the half that got the guided imagery um, kept their hands in the bucket of ice water for almost three minutes. And the folks who uh, didn't get the guided imagery, they did some innocuous bibli uh, bibliotherapy, kept their hands in a bucket of ice water for a minute and a half. So significant statistically, but practically significant as well. Um, hope and diet, we've done some studies looking at um, how hope is a great predictor of healthy diet choice uh, in stores. Hope and sport, some great work out there. Hope and su academic success this is what I want to focus a few seconds on here. Um, hope, the reason why I focus on those education uh, applications is that hope um, in high schoolers predicts credits earned, GPA, and attendance. Credits earned, GPA, and attendance. Over and above past GPA. And attendance is, when you take hope to college, hope trumps high school GPA, ACT, and SAT when predicting GPA and retention. And retention. And it does a wonderful dance with engagement uh, to keep kids in school over the long haul. Um, I'm going to focus just a little bit. I'm out of time here, but um, we asked that question, um, so I'm anxious to see what, what uh, Bill gets and Fran uh, get with their results. But we asked that question about leadership and what are, what are the things you need from a leader. So we asked that question, we, we asked that actually question two times, um, and this was, was for the work in strengths-based leadership um, in that book. And the answers, um, after we coded the data, compassion, stability, trust, and hope. Those were the four things. Compassion, stability, trust, and hope are the four things followers need from leaders. Um, when we studied high hope companies, we also found that um, they just don't have, like having a lot of fear around. High hope companies are not motivated by fear. There's a level playing field. There's trust. There's great communication. 
Um, and I think if we're going to lead this next generation of leaders, then we have to get them enthusiastic about the future. We have to get them to do what they do best every day. And we have to let them take that hope into different parts of their lives and transform their own lives. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Good afternoon. Really enjoyed uh, listening. I'd rather do that than talk, actually. But um, I want to. I want to uh, talk today about some things we've learned with regard to, to well-being around the world, and uh, so think about. I want to think about it broad from a start, and then think about what we've done to understand engagement, what drives engagement in the workplace. The first question I get a lot is this one, and um, we've been hearing a lot about well-being today from a positive emotion. We want to maximize our positive emotions, min minimize our negative emotions, but we still need some negative emotions. But uh, I've been listening to a lot of folks like Danny Kahneman at Princeton and Ed Diener and others talk about well-being over the last several years. And there's really a couple categories that I think are important to, to think about. And, and I think any definition we have of well-being has to be, um, be all-encompassing. But here's our definition. Well-being is all the things that are important to how we think about and experience our lives. And those words are chosen purposefully. Think about meaning we really have two selves. We have an evaluating self that summarizes things, and we have a, a uh, so that's the remembering self, and we have an experiencing self that goes through life on a daily basis, has all these emotions we've been talking about. And any definition of well-being that we, that we implement, we think has to include those two things. Here's what I mean by that. We've got a lot of different well-being uh, dimensions out there, um, some of them more traditional objective measures, of course, GDP, health, in business, profit, um, employment statistics, literacy, poverty, then all the subjective ones we've been studying fit into those two categories. Evaluation uh, questions. If I asked you a question about your family life, you might give me a positive response, but if I asked you to think about yesterday and the experiences you've had, you might think about an argument, you might think about um, a success a kid had. You, did, you think about different elements that don't necessarily go into that evaluating self. And those, in effect, affect our physiology. Um, over time. They accumulate, but we don't always remember those experiences. And so we think one of the goals of leadership has to be to help people um, create short-term incentives that align with those longer-term goals and increase their positive emotions throughout the day. Um, just historically at Gallup, we have, uh, we've been studying well-being. It really goes back, we've been in it pretty heavy the last 10 years or so, but it really goes back to the 30s with the work of George Gallup. We did numerous international polls in the 50s and 60s that continued where Dr. Gallup wrote a book called The Secrets of a Long Life, studied people who lived to be 95 years and older, um, learned a number of things in that study that were new at that time that may, may not be too surprising today, but uh, um, one of them was that uh, people in jobs where they had to move around a lot tended to live longer. So this thing we call exercise today, um, they actually did exercise but didn't call it that. They, they, they moved around a lot. They're physically active um, throughout the day. They had jobs they love. Over 80 percent of them had jobs that they loved every day and they tended to work into their 80s. So there's something about just activity and purpose, uh, an interesting story in those data. Um, this research continued into the 70s and 80s um, with community vitality polls in the 90s. Don Clifton had a chance to work with him on a number of these community studies in the 90s to understand what it's like to live in a place that that uh, is fulfilling. Um, world polls on life satisfaction, work, health, education, war, and respect, um, the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and Asia, so a number of world polls starting. And in 2005-06, we started the first true world poll of a representative sample of the world's citizens. And um, this is our coverage of the world poll in green. Now, we've limited it to this planet so far. <laughs> And we do have a, a few areas that are more difficult to get to, but it's expanded into uh, uh, numerous places in Africa where we have people out on the ground doing random samples of different villages in Africa. And so these are representative samples um, all over the world, and it gives us a framework, us well-being researchers, a framework for understanding what matters in people's lives, and it gives leaders a way to think about what uh, people are thinking. Um, so if you think about life evaluation, for instance, and, and how do we think about our lives around the world, if you do a weighted average of how people evaluate their lives, we, we, we use three categories, thriving, struggling, and suffering. The percentage of thriving people around the world is 24%, a weighted average around the world. Those are people who say, on a zero to 10 scale, in their present life, 
there are seven, and in the future they think there'll be an eight. So the natural state of man is to think that the future will be better than the present. That's pretty consistent across the world. When that's not the case, it's a real problem. Um, the suffering percent, that's the, that's the percentage of people who are zero to four today and think their life in the next five years will be zero to four also. So they think the next five years will be just as bad as the present. Um, that's a more desperate state. That percentage ranges from less than 1% in Ireland to as high as about 40% in Zimbabwe. The uh, thriving percent ranges from less than 5% in Cambodia to, to uh, as high as over 80% in, in Denmark. And so uh, there's wide range on this evaluation measure and it's, it's more income sensitive than some of the other measures. There's, a, there's more of a correlation with this measure in, in income and socioeconomics than some of the experience questions we ask. But what do we experience in a typical day? Interestingly, that even though only 24% are thriving, 87% on any given day say they're treated with respect. That's a positive. 77% say they smile or laugh a lot on any given day. 76% have a lot of enjoyment. 71% feel well rested. But only 45% learn or do something interesting on any given day. So there's a lot of opportunity there. If we think about what we can do to, to boost well-being, it might be that one element about interest and learning and how people fit with what they're asked to do. Um, from a negative emotion, of course, as, as Barbara and others have noted, these negative emotions sting more. So just having some of them um, is a problem. But about one in five have sadness, have a lot of sadness on any given day. 20% anger, 23% physical pain, 29% stress, and 31% um, worry. As I always listen to stories about kids, I'm always reminded that as adults we really don't grow up, do we? We, we just uh, uh, learn how to manage ourselves a little better and we still have the same emotions, right? We still have that raw, those raw emotional states. We just manage them differently than, than a kid would and that's what, what kids learn over time. But um, in getting to the elements that really matter the most, we try to leverage all this existing research. So we try to move from global to individual well-being and develop some metrics that individuals can use and track over time. We tested hundreds of our best questions across all different life situations. We looked at how people view their life in the present. We looked at how they think, think their life will be in the next five years, their hope, their daily experiences. We looked at whether their life, uh, they feel their life will exceed their wildest expectations. We looked at health outcomes, changes in disease burden, and many other uh, outcomes that were specific to different domains we were studying. These are the five that really generalized across the world, across the different people that we had a chance to study. Uh, career well-being here is a bit broad. It's about how people occupy their time. So this corresponds to people who are retired, people who are, who are students 13 and older. Um, so it, it's really about having some purpose and fulfillment in what you do every day. That's an important element across the world. And one of the most overlooked elements, actually. Social well-being is about having relationships and love in your life. Financial well-being is about managing your economic life to reduce stress and increase security. And uh, physical well-being is about having energy every day, of course, good health. And community well-being is about uh, being in an engaged environment. Um, and at a basic level, it's about safety. But beyond that, it's about engagement and involvement in the area where you live. That's the most overlooked area. When we ask about importance of different well-being elements, that's the one that's overlooked the most. And, but people that assign more importance to community well-being actually have higher well-being. Uh, people who assign more importance to financial well-being um, actually have lower well-being. But the people who give a balance, if you ask people to give 100 points across these five categories and their importance, the people who had more balance in their importance assignment actually had the highest levels of overall well-being, which I thought was kind of interesting. These are five areas where we really should seek some level of, of balance, whatever that means to us individually. The other thing we learned, a basic discovery, is that organizations are uniquely positioned to uh, improve the well-being of their employees. That investing in employee well-being um, can create a substantial return to individuals and organizations. Four areas in, in career well-being that we found generalize are having interesting and meaningful activities, using your strengths, achieving goals, and having a leader or a mentor to motivate you on a regular basis. In the workplace, in organizations we've had a chance to study, we, we've asked uh, the same set of questions to 15 million people. It's now closer to 18 million, I guess, in uh, people in 169 different countries in workplaces around the world. There are 12 elements that uh, we've written quite a bit about that, that do predict outcomes that organizations are interested in. Um, so these are for full and part-time employees in, in workplaces around the world, workplaces where people have managers. The first one is knowing what's expected. It's, it's one of the most overlooked. 
but only a little over half the people in the world clearly know what's expected of them at work, and I'd argue if that one isn't right, then, then the other ones won't matter as much because people aren't directed and focused in a way that they should be. Having what you need to do your work is important, of course. Um, as Shane mentioned, being in, a, being in a job where you have a chance to do what you do best is very important. Um, getting recognition or praise. Is there anybody in here who's suffering from too much recognition or praise today? Yeah, we, uh, even though managers think they can give too much recognition, I haven't found too many that do. So to get to that 11 to 1 that Barbara was talking about, that ratio of 11 to 1 is pretty difficult. Um, but it's really about making it right for the individual and uh, making sure that the recognition is appropriate for the individual, making sure it's performance related and that it's very frequent. Um, someone at work cares about me as a person. Um, these, these workers in, in productive work environments say there is someone who cares about them. It relates to just about every outcome we've had a chance to study. And does someone at work encourage your development? So these first six are the foundational elements. And our, I'd argue from all the data I've had the chance to look at that if you, if you don't get these first six right, then the next six don't matter as much. These are foundational. They're the overlooked kind of basics that people, for, the managers tend to forget about as they're managing people. And um, opinions counting is important. That builds on those first six. Being uh, connected to the mission or purpose of the company. So do they feel that they're a part of a tribe that's important? Um, are their coworkers committed to quality work? We asked uh, people long ago, are you committed to quality work? What kind of answer do you think we got to that? Of course I'm committed to doing quality work, but if I ask you about your coworkers, you get a different answer and it sorts out the productive teams from the less productive teams and says something pretty important about the culture. Having a friend at work, that's an odd one that people question all the time, but it's one that continuously predicts different outcomes. Now, there are people who have friends at work who aren't productive, of course. They get into gripe sessions, but that's because these foundational, those first six elements aren't in place. Um, and you can't make people be friends at work, of course. That'd be kind of creepy, but you can, you can create environments where people get to know each other and people, where people are encouraged to get to know each other. Um, talking about progress, of course, very important, and uh, having chances to learn and grow is a, it's a very important element. So those are the 12 that we found generalized across different workplaces. Um, only 28% of the people in, in the United States right now are engaged, 54% are not engaged, and 18% are actively disengaged. The disengaged people are the ones that get even with the organization because they're pretty turned off. They give negative ratings to those 12 items. Um, the engaged people, though, look out for you. Most of the people are in that middle camp where they show up to work, do the minimum required, and not much else. So we think it's important to improve this ratio. We've seen organizations get that up to very high levels of uh, over 20 to 1 in some cases, um, engaged to actively disengaged. The interesting thing, though, is that companies vary tremendously. The bottom quartile has less in our database, has less than one engaged employee for every actively disengaged. The top quartile in our database has closer to a ratio of five engaged for every actively disengaged. These effects, these differences aren't just due to industry, they're, they're, they're due to what this, or these organizations have done over time. They've managed toward issues that are performance related. So a study by Alan Kruger at Princeton, at the American Time Use Study, that I thought was very telling, where um, they, uh, in this American Time Use Study, they, they assessed what people were doing during the day, who they were with, how they felt. The best times of the day, it turns out, were religious times, sports and exercise, eating and drinking, relaxing and leisure, and socializing. Not too surprising. The worst, worst times of the day were adult care, so taking care of another adult. Education, sorry. Um, just sharing the data here. Medical care, household management, and the worst time of the day um, was time working with your supervisor. Worse than cleaning the toilet. <laughs> now, I know this is a positive psychology conference, so I'm going to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. Our data would show that it doesn't, but it, sa it says something that speaks to one of our findings that we had about a decade ago, where we found when we go into any organization in the world for the first time, we tend to find this kind of a pattern, a nice bell-shaped curve that us researchers love but companies hate, because as uh, Kim was saying, there's a there's range that we can't manage. There's unpredictability. So this is the number of work groups at different levels of engagement from high to low in, in the typical organization we study. And of course not all, every organization is like this. Over time organizations get a lot more into this top quartile where great leading occurs. So great leading occurs up here. It's because they're focusing on those 12 elements over time and they're improving on them. Um, some managers and leaders just have a predisposition that makes them better at doing that. But 
our goal is to shift that distribution and it has performance implications. We've seen in our large uh, meta-analytics study, we've seen connections, uh, this includes 32,000 business units in our latest update, um, connections to absenteeism and turnover and shrinkage and safety. So less, less theft, less turnover, less absenteeism, less safety for those that are in the top quartile of our database versus the bottom. Um, significant linkages to patient safety, medical errors, quality, um, like defects, defect measures in organizations, um, customer metrics of loyalty and engagement, productivity measures, and of course they all build up to that financial outcome of, of profitability. We see about a 16% difference between the top and the bottom quartile of our database business units in profitability. Um, so engagement doesn't explain everything, but it explains a significant amount that improves the odds for people who manage toward those particular issues. We did another study um, where we looked at engagement, stress, and physical health. I worked on this with Arthur Stone at Stony Brook. He's an expert in these momentary measures. And we didn't study babies here. We studied uh, adults. But we, they, they, had a, they, they had an active heart monitor so that we could, we could measure their heart rate. They spit into saliva tubes six times a day on cue um, randomly where they're, they're reminded through a Blackberry type advice where they're asked questions about their mood in the moment. And we collected saliva to, to capture cortisol and to look at how cortisol, the stress hormone, relates to actual momentary moods. And cortisol, of course, happens more in the morning. It's a, it's a, we did see the diurnal cycle where cortisol is higher in the morning in this sample, as you'd expect. But we also found that in moments where people, over 2,000 moments we sampled here, where people had higher perceived stress, they did have higher cortisol in the moment, on average, a significant relationship there. But on the positive end, people who had higher happiness had lower levels of cortisol in the moment. This is after controlling for time of day, so we controlled for that morning effect. And the other one that was a, probably the newest finding from this study was interest in the moment. When people had higher levels of interest in the moment, they had lower physiological uh, cortisol. So there's some connection between what we're experiencing at work and, uh, and physiology. We also, before we did this study, before we did any of the momentary measurement, we measured how engaged they were in their work on those 12 questions that I just showed you. And so we looked at people with low engagement and high engagement and what their momentary moods were throughout the day. You can see, let me grab this. You see these people with low engagement and how their day starts off pretty bad in terms of this is their level of happiness throughout the day in the moment. See what they're perceiving right before they leave work. They're, it's like being in school and waiting for that bell to ring, right? And then these are the people with high engagement. Look at how it peaks up. Look at how it peaks up in the morning. It stays pretty high throughout the day. And then it actually drops a little bit as they're anticipating leaving work. Um, what about interest? Look at how interest peaks. Now, we didn't plan this meeting for Shane. Our, our session here shouldn't probably be in the afternoon. Because huh? interest drops in the afternoon. But look at the high levels of interest. Um, for, for people in engaged environments. And um, here's stress. You can see big differences in stress throughout the day in, in terms of their moods. Um, but I guess my point is it doesn't have to be that way. We see weekday, weekend differences also. We do a daily poll of 1,000 people and we see big differences between weekdays and holidays. So these, pipe, these spikes are holidays and, and weekends on mood here. Um, but it doesn't have to be that extreme. When we look at engaged people, and compared to disengaged people, the drop in mood is, uh, is twice as great for disengaged people from, sun from Sunday to Monday. And so, you know, there's plenty of research that shows heart attacks are more likely to happen on Mondays. There's probably a reason for that. There's a dramatic shift in mood. We saw it in our momentary study. We also see it in the broader population studies we do. Dramatic shift in mood um, between uh, weekends and weekdays. But it's not nearly as, as, as significant a drop for people who are engaged in their work. Um, the, just the act of coming to work, though, it's real clear in the data, increases stress, even if you're in an engaged job. But I think the key point that I've heard earlier, earlier today is that we can offset that increase in stress by just creating more positive environments where people have more positive emotions that buffer those stressful situations at work. I'm going to break here in just a second because we need to take some questions. So this is that weekday weekend effect. Um, the other thing, I'm going to end with this one, it's kind of an interesting chart, that explained mood the most throughout the day was 
we ask people in the moment whether they're working with somebody, whether they like the person they're working with. Is that that simple? Do you like the person or people you're working with right now? Look at the mood throughout the day for people um, in a low engagement environment, how much it fluctuates. Or, you know, so it drops when they get to work. At noon, they're, they get with their workplace buddy and gripe about their job. They go back to work. And then, be, and then before they leave, they get back with their workplace buddy and gripe about their job. What a lousy day they had. And then the people with high engagement, throughout the day, they like who they're with most of the day. And that was the best explanation for the differences in mood throughout the day, just who you're with and whether you like that. Of course, interest was another big one. I'm going to end there so we have time for some questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. He told you that interest waned in the afternoon. We have a question right here in the front. Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, we, we do a pretty good job of defining hope. How do we actually measure it? Um, we measure it with, uh, depending on the project, with adults, we measure it with eight easy items. Um, with students, we measure it with six items, uh, fifth grade through twelfth grade on the student poll. And um, the items are very simple. I, I can think of many ways to, get a, uh, to solve any problem. Um, that would be an ideas question. Um, I have enough energy uh, or lots of energy to pursue my goals. That would be an energy question. And we typically have three or four uh, ideas questions, three or four energy questions. Um, and students don't know that we're measuring hope. We tell them it's a goal scale. Um, and we do that because we, we want the questions to be engaging, but we don't want them to say, oh yeah, I'm hopeful, let me bump everything up. And there was a question earlier today about, um, you know, uh, well, a comment Todd made, everybody says they're hopeful. That's not true. 50% of American students uh, that we've surveyed, um, and we've surveyed close to 400,000 now, say they're hopeful. Um, and then 50% of American adults and some other studies uh, say they're hopeful. And I just got, uh, we helped with selection of uh, scholarship students for a local project. Um, and we had 200 applicants, and only 50% said they were hopeful. So um, on our measures, which are, um, I think, um, less, uh, less face valid, but valid in all the other ways, um, we, we get to get at hope about people knowing we're asking directly about construct. I've got a question. Right here? Yep. So, in the, in a lot of, you know, the book up in search of excellence showed, yeah, there were companies that could sustain excellence, but after some number of years, they ended up being, you know, going back to some normal performance. In your data, have you found anybody that has, is an outlier on the great leadership side of things that's outperforming the market for an extended period of time? We, uh, we've uh, had a chance to study Interesting question because we've had a chance to study during the down economy a, a number of companies. Um, and I'm trying to think about the ones I can give, per, give you permission for, but I can tell you in general that when we looked at changes in the economy, uh, the companies that held their own were the ones that were doing a better job of engaging their employees in the first place. And they continued to grow it. So 70% of the organizations in our database continued to grow engagement during the down economy. And they put themselves in a better position. Now, we looked at the earnings per share over time for the publicly traded ones. They did substantially better than their competitors if they were doing the right things for their employees. So to some of Kim's points earlier, um, there's definitely a relationship there. Um, Best Buy is an example that's done really well. Um, we've worked with them for a long time relative to competitors. They've just done a great job over time of, of managing people and all those different factors. But um, there, there are a number of other ones we write about in our Gallup Management Journal. But um, I think the key is that you kind of cushion yourself against the probability of something bad happening um, when you engage your employees because they're in a state where they're looking out for your best interests instead of making excuses. It's so easy to make excuses when things are going wrong, right? And uh, these companies that are managing that kind of buffer themselves for the future. I've got a question here. It goes to the issue of uh, your kid comes home with an A and an F. Uh, going back to that, not that I'm worrying about that quite yet, but it, it's in that it's in that ballpark. Question is, where on that where on that spectrum 
would you put working with someone to help them unlock their strengths? It's not a weakness per se, but it's rather it's a strength that, they're not, that, that, that you believe they have, maybe even they believe they have, but they're, they're not really able to, to deploy. Can you talk to that a bit? I'll let Jim take a stab. I thought that was yours. Oh, okay, that's my. Um, well, I'm going to duck the question a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in in all students knowing their strengths um, because it, it allows you to create different kind of conversations um, from the start. So, but to get to your point, um, so to unlock those strengths, I, I love that best self narrative. Um, so wherever you are, let's say let's say you you made a C. Um, but it's something you're interested in and you want to do well and it relates to your future. Um, if it doesn't, I might be fine with the C. Um, but if you're my child and I'm talking to you, which would be strange, but um, if you're my child and I'm talking to you and, and we want to work with that C, I might ask you, tell me about a time when you did well in that course and what was going right for you. What was the teacher doing? What were your friends doing? Who were you hanging out with? What was the nature of the assignment? So I might move towards that best self-narrative and, and work around that C in a different way even though I already know their strengths in other areas. I'm going to push back at it just a, a little bit and, and, and I'm sort of getting behind your charter here so, so I apologize if, if, if it's you know off in, in left field. The question is is there anything that you know of that might work with sort of blocking factors about removing blocking factors? Um, define blocking factors, just obstacles to, to success? Uh, obstacles, uh, obstacles to the to the use of the strength. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, Gabrielle Adigen, um out at uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany does some great work uh, around mental contrasting. Um, and mental contrasting, basically, when when you fantasize about the future, is a free fantasy. When you contrast the future to the present and identify the obstacles, it becomes an expectation, and then you can be hopeful within the context of those thoughts, not in the context of a free fantasy. And then she has some great, great ideas for how to strategically get around obstacles. So I would refer you to her work, Gabrielle Ottigen, uh, out of Max Planck, because it addresses that directly. I'm familiar with some of her earlier stuff. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We have time for one more question. Um, I had a question. I was just wondering where I could go to have my high school junior take the, the strength quest mm -hmm. assessment. That's a great question. Then I'm going to ask Jim a question. So we're going to sneak in one more question. Um, if you go to strengthsquest.com, um, you can find out a lot more about it. Um, uh, what's interesting, um, there are kind of different paths to getting strengths through Gallup work. I think mostly through books on the enterprise side. So if you buy strengths-based leadership, how full is your bucket? Um, several other books that I'm liking on right now. Strength, Strength, Strength Finder is on a lot of books. Yeah, Strength Finder 2.0 might be the least expensive book out there. Yeah. You're just looking to take the instrument. Um, but it's connected to most of our books that are out there. But if you go to strengthsquest.com, you could also order a code. It's, it's one of our only venues where you can get a code without a book. Um, or um, get your high school excited about it, your kid's high school excited about it, and, and, and maybe the PTO will front some codes. Um, or contact me directly, I might help you. Um, just her. Um, I want to ask Jim a quick question, though, about um, career well-being. Make it easy. I know. It's about uh, career well-being, which, which I think is, is relevant to everyone here, whether they're in education or uh, enterprise or civil service. How do we promote, uh, what are some steps to promoting career well-being if we want to drive that? Well, I, th I think one of them starts with strengths. I mean, you've got to get you got you got to help people know who they are, and I think that starts in school. It starts at when people are first employed in organizations. You need to have a foundation about who they are to, to begin with, and then um, the other thing that people, that great managers and leaders tend to do that other people overlook, is they think about how they use that knowledge about their talents, their strengths, um, to get to some outcome. So that by knowing what is expected of me at work piece, um, they don't just sit there and tell people what to do. They trust that they can find a path to that outcome. So they're really clear about the outcomes, clear about who are you, and all the in-between stuff can be very individual. Um, so think about you know how, how we develop people in a flexible kind of way. And does it have a social dynamic as well? Oh, de definitely. I mean, people uh, people connect with their coworkers in a in a lot of different ways, and I think that that social element is is critical to understand. Um, and I think actually change is most likely to happen. Some of the things we're, we're working on 
right now are related to, to health care costs. Now we can help organizations decrease health care costs, and that is most likely to happen um, through social networks. Some really good research by Nicholas Christakis at Harvard on social networks and how it's, how it's related to change over time. And I think it's the same thing in organizations. If you don't understand and appreciate social networks and how they manifest themselves, then um, I, anyway, I think that's where change will happen, is through organizations. Please join me in thanking Shane and Jim.